Over the mic. Over. Bu bağız var nerede ya? Bir gün el eğitim. Oo. Aa. Yok. Ne şey yapın sen? Bu çakmalı son. Neyse. Aykoğlu. Ne fahşı. Hey. Lan umutum. Ayısı batı var ne gitsin. Bak bir sitem umutu atıyor. Gelen sayı sarma var. Lan eğitim var. Onu şahine var. Marayın ara abone var. Ne fahşı var. Her gün var. Emel abone. Yok. Yok. able to put a e, e laptop la, nah. for a e, e presentation that he speaks the prof. Actually, he wants to... This table is so small. Yeah. This mic, he less 30 feet now. Okay. So if we had something like... Uh, <laughs> 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 Come on, Mike. Ah, I'm gonna try my my interview. Yeah, you keep saying you could make could make make that ticket. I answer. Ah, I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I He's going to get a guest, I can't hear you. Hey, Nebat, we are in my funeral. Yeah. Ah, eh. Uh -uh. Maybe he's just a funeral old. I won't mind now to put your picture in your young and young and a man. Come to this funeral, Professor Rosa. He knows I am your boy. I go to our five sisters. I move about our chicken and you said, ah. I can't 
on Twitter. No, I'm no, 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 no. Ah, what are you No, no. Well, fun. She's going to talk to the 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 Issue. Yeah. And the reverse, yeah. one of the things that's fucked. Yeah, at that time. Yeah, you that know, because Africans were introduced as a medium of instruction, yeah. and the, the students also were to give them daily life. Yeah. And that's, that's why we prefer the process of the So, amongst the questions that I'm going to ask is basically that you tell us what you know, back there, what, what, may, what may say, you know. What made young people to stand up? Yes. Yes. And uh, the second one, we, we look at yeah, it. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. You guys, like yeah. then, you saw something wrong, you stood against it. Yes. Uh, you were even yeah. willing to give your life. Mara, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Uh, today, uh, yes, uh, can you smile to celebrate the role uh, yeah. uh, that it takes uh, in the past year of the country? Uh, that's a young people. <coughs> uh, so you tell us, as a family, Robin, today, what does this mean? That, you know, what he stood up for, fought for, you know, yeah. has his role. Uh, it's been commemorated. Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. I'm ready. I got two guests. Uh, the first guest is Kintate D. It's the brother. Mm, I'm going to send studio. They are supers now. Mm, yeah. Then you tell studio I've sent them a WhatsApp card, their name. William Esther, let me tell us. <coughs> so, D. Rekwalayana, D. Sabina Machini. Machini. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 So, I'm going to go to the house. i the yeah, how's it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to send it to Esther. Yeah. Um, that Omri, recall us Omri. Yeah, yeah. Omri, O M R Y. You're right. R Y, you're right. And then Mahuadi, M A K G O G O A. So, G O A L E. L E. Yeah, that's how we write it. We pronounce it like double M. Yeah. Yeah. No, get not suit. Not suit. Yeah. Former. How are you? I'm okay. Just one cup. Sure. Yeah. mate? So, give me guy. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. There's no government participation. Oh. All. Yeah. They come as guests. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> I'm dizzy and I, I, I took medication for yeah. flu. I don't have much time. Now I must be healthy. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. I am. I'm getting program sound. Uh, tell me, what time will, be, will they be coming to us? Because my guest has to leave now. Okay, cool. Oh, they're going to come. They said 10 past. Huh? Okay, okay, in two minutes. Cool, cool. I can hear. Oh, good. Okay. I can hear the studio, yes. Okay, they're gonna Okay. Let's begin to they're coming to us. So any minute from now. It's on fire, so it's on fire. 
Yes, well, good day to in studio coming to you right here from Soweto Morris Isaac School, High School rather, uh, where uh, uh, we're going to witness uh, a memorial lecture in honor of Tietzi Machine in one of the leaders in 1976 uh, amongst young people, which they decided to take a stand against, uh, um, or, or rather opine with regards to action, uh, you know, taking a stand against uh, the action of the brutal apartheid. Uh, but with me today here, I have a couple of guests uh, uh, that are going to talk to us with regards to the event today with me, I'm with Tate D. Machinini, the brother of Tate Machinini. Thank you for your time. Uh, today, commemoration of Youth Day, this month I mean, um, as the family, how does, that, how does it make you feel that, you know, um, your brother, you know, his, his role during that time uh, is being, you know, honoured? Uh, the month of June is very important to us as a family, um, particularly June 16th, the day, uh, being a public holiday, we, we celebrate the life of a young man who led a huge student uprising in Soweto in the midst of police brutality. Uh, so June, is, it's a very important month for us in that we not only celebrate, we look back to the achievements that were brought about by June 16 itself. Uh, and there's quite a number of those achievements. I remember it was not about uh, uh, Africans uh, as a language. It was Africans as a medium of instruction in black township schools. That was the problem, which within a few days' time, it converted into a struggle against apartheid. So that struggle culminates today in what we refer to as freedom, as democracy, uh, we just gone through elections, young people have voted and so on and so forth. We are happy about that. Uh, talking about you know, uh, the role that young people can you know, play in a society or in a democracy like South Africa, 25 years uh, on, uh, we have seen uh, the Fist Must Fall movement. Do you believe that the youth have the same character as the youth of 1976? It's very difficult to compare characters of generations. Uh, you know, in 1976, as a young man, you grow up, uh, as you walk out of the gate of your home, uh, there's a chance that you can be arrested for a passbook. There's a chance that you can be arrested for loafer's cup. Loafer's cup means you, you're unemployed, you're loafing around the township, you can be arrested for that. So the youth of 1970s were faced with serious challenges. Challenges that don't give you a piece of freedom. They don't give you a, a piece, like a minute piece of freedom. You don't have that sort of thing. But the youth of today, uh, different from that of 76, I mean, you know, the technology is high, everything is good, there is democracy, there is governance, there is, there is uh, you know, your own political parties are in power and so on. But my biggest problem today, you know, we witness a lot of uh, school killings. Uh, I'm not able to separate that generation of, of people at high schools and what you refer to as youth. School killings, killings uh, I mean, think about it, you take your, your child to school and before you know it, the kid is dead, has been stabbed by another youth and so on. I, I don't want to talk about Fizma's fault. That was a different struggle and I think those, those, those youth, they won that struggle. Today, some of them or a large number of them are going to school free of charge and so on and so on. They got proper accommodation and so on. But I, I, I'm more concerned about the school killings. That is w big to me. Uh, one last question I have. They set the tone, the youth of 1976, and they showed that, you know, uh, youth, uh, young people can take a stand. Um, do you think, as a family member, that, you know, wherever Uunta Tetsi is, he's happy with uh, the situation, especially amongst youth? We're talking about unemployment, but we talk, you spoke about the fees must fall. You spoke about um, what's happening in high school. Uh, do you think that he's happy where he is, looking at the situation that he's facing young people now? <laughs> I'm not sure if he's happy. I, I, I doubt if he's happy. But, uh, you know, 25 years of, of democracy is quite a, a, a short time. I mean, the boy is only 25 years old today. So let's allow the, 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 the young men to grow. Let's work towards uh, 
upbringing of this kid. I mean, it, it, it's just a democracy. These youngsters, these youth, they need to be led, they need to be guided, they need to be supported with resources, they need to be assisted with so much for them to grow up and become a proper democracy and, and begin to lead that democracy and, and take away certain of our powers from us, the adults. They need to go ahead and not only enjoy, but lead and take the resources of the state and make South Africa a different country. Thank you so much. Uh I'm going to talk to Omre. Omre, um, you are a former classmate. Yes. You were there when all this happened. Yes. Just uh, in a short time, take us through what transpired on that day or that time. Yeah, basically uh, the action committee of the South African Student Movement uh, 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 planned this march uh, and uh, disseminated the information throughout the high schools of Soweto so that uh, all the seven high schools in Soweto at that time could lead the marches uh, of uh, secondary schools nearby uh, in route to go towards Orlando and so on. So here at Morris Isaacson, of course, we were led by JT Machine and Mafia Morobe. Uh, they were the people that uh, you know, gave us all the instruction as to what should, what, what, what should be done, uh, how the march is going to be, what we must do. So we were uh, in that side, I mean, getting the first-hand information from the, the leader himself, the state machine. So I would say that we, we were okay, you know, we were led in the proper way by state machine. And let's for, for, fast forward. Uh, 2019, uh, the youth are facing a different struggle. Um, do you think this youth is, you know, staking from the steps of uh, CHC machining, the likes of CHC machining, and the leaders back then? I mean, you were there uh, when the uh, 1976 uprising happened, and you are here now. Just talk to us about the situation uh, today and then. Yeah, I think, I think the youth of today are faced with different problems than those we had. We were faced with uh, Africans as a medium of instruction. We were faced with apartheid. But today, all that is no more, you know. They are faced with a big problem that uh, they must study, they must learn, you know. Uh, they must learn about fourth industrial revolution. They must, you know, uh, study more. They are free to study more. Facilities are there. Greetings all in the name of our Father Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you all stand and have maybe one verse from a one common chorus? Just one verse, any chorus, please.
and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Before we Hello, before we proceed with our program, can we all stand up for our national anthem? Not a good singer. <coughs> Anyone in the audience, if you can start for us, go see Lely Africa, and then we'll join you. As we continue our program, I just wanted to share something with you quickly before I announce then our next speaker. Those of you who attended this wonderful school of ours, Morris Isaacson, <clears throat> you are probably familiar with our logo and our motto. So I just wanted to share with everyone. Our motto is a Latin motto that says, Veritas vos liberat bit. <clears throat> Clearly meaning, truth shall set you free. And isn't it ironic that the person that we are celebrating and you know, remembering today truly, truly lived up to this motto? And many, many of you who are sitting here and those who also perished, who sacrificed their lives, that they really, really lived up to this motto of truth shall set you free. 
just thought I should share with you. Our next speaker is a representative from Putanang Youth Trust. Mudise Mutloba. I see here Mudise is not available. We've got Ndate Peter. Is it Kopane or Kopano? You can come and represent Putanang Trust. I'll be representing Putanang Youth Trust. Putana Youth Trust was established in 20, 2004 by Mama Ruth and Mudise Mutlok. They saw it fit to establish the organization that will empower and encourage the youth in Jabab. Putana Youth Trust throughout the years has been and still is empowering the youth around the community through programs that they have established. Some of the programs that are run by Putanang are education, where we offer bazaaris for our local um, matriculants each year. Uh, we offer also Saturday school program for our primary school learners from grade one to grade seven. And we also do career expos as well. We are not only focusing on education, but we also do uh, sports where we sponsor basketball, tennis, and soccer around Jabavu. Putana Youth Trust, being one of the organizations focusing on the youth of Jabavu, naturally associates itself with the TSC Machine Memorial Lecture because TSC was a youth from Jabavu. Maurice Isaacson alumni is made up of people who are youth in a school that is in Jabab. It was therefore easy for PYT to associate itself with projects for the benefit of a school that is in Jabab. Through catering for a wider audience of uh, youth throughout Soweto, since the beginning of the lectures, Putanang has always been a strategic supporter of, a, of the lecture. We are now anticipating a working relationship whereby Maurice Isaacson, Maurice Isaacson alumni will avail some of its skills and personnel to other initiatives that Putanang will be, uh, will be embarking on. So I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder of our hashtag, those who are on Twitter, social media, it's hashtag fourth machine in a memo lecture. As we move along, <clears throat> there's a song that I would like you to help me sing. It's the song that actually pricked my mind during the June 16, 1976 uprising. So I know most of you, if my first year, I always say, I'm going to go to the house. I've got a, 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 
a terrible voice, as in singing voice, but I know Honaliba Dibi you'll just follow through again. Siso ba tu bulang e my ma, tu bulang e my ma. Africa of Soweto, long live. Long live. Thank you. You know, um, there's a reason why I asked you to sing that song. It was one of those songs that, as I said, pricked my mind. Um, I'm from Deep Kloof Soweto. During the uprising, I was like nine years old, but very inquisitive. Um, so I would always peek through, you know, the Rent Daily Mail. I think it was the Post, if I'm not mistaken, at the time, just reading the headlines. And I would hear, obviously, the songs. And outside, I would keep on, you know, singing these struggle songs outside. And my mom would say, when I'm like, Maphodisa tlo kokota mo one day because u busy u dubula ba tu dubula mo ba tlo go tsa o tlo felletsa o le ko John Foster so the reason why i said let's sing it is to celebrate the freedom of being able to sing these songs you know because we come from an era where things couldn't be said couldn't be read and and quickly just to share with you Peter ukokai Where's Peter? Uzwin, Peter Machinini. Peter was my desk mate, Momo Morris. And we would read certain material, you know, your, your books, Bobo Roots, and many others. But read Peter again. So, hence, I'm saying these songs are here to say we are free to share, to sing, and to remember, as we are doing today. We are gathered here in this school in honor of Tietzi Machinin, Ahuna di Hippo, Ahuna di Tiergez. So that's the spirit. Thank you. So we are going to have an item 
a drama and poetry item rendered by our young achievers. If they can come to the stage and present their drama and poetry for us. Thank you. Is this what they fought for? Is this what they fought for? For us to make that choice in the name of freedom. For us to die young by means of having a good time at home. Without them, we wouldn't see bra. We wouldn't be so jubilant about Saturday night in Namachita. Since 1991, South Africa was regenerated. For us to live lavish and be treated equally because we are black and we are human. But did they die for us to maltreat our rights? Did they die for us to die by means of having a Saturday night with Namashita? Young sister, young brother, this, this life ain't about me. This life ain't no game. It ain't simple and plain. It's about how you use your brain. Could we have more inspiration, motivation, creation, passion, apprehension, perspiration of patience, and a bit of inspiration? This day is celebrated to commemorate the 1976 Soweto uprising. Not a day for you to use as a tool for to make that decisions to look cool. Live long, TNT. Live long. <laughs> a part of my South African history. A peaceful march turned into a blood spill. Such a painful memory. Such a painful memory to the families of the victims. Ash. On the day, lots and lots of kids were killed in their school uniforms. Today we say, we acknowledge all your efforts. We are the future generation that you sacrificed your lives for. We stand here deeply in pain, realizing that our youth is dying each and every day. Age. The youth of today doesn't seem to know the meaning of unity being power. We as young creative, we as young creative achievers, we are inspired by the youth of 1976. The youth that was together as one. The Basutu, Babedi, Bafana, Favenda, the Zulu, anymore. It's the path, the path that ends. If we were the letters of Maurice Jackson, we would respect our teachers, our education, and most importantly, this famous age. Our inspiration. Our inspiration has nothing to do with our education, but it's all about our emotions, running deeply into our passion. The youth of today, your wisdom should be based on your knowledge. And your knowledge is your education. Your knowledge is your education. Your knowledge is your education. Age. 1976. It is our pride and pain. It is our truth. And because of that, we will rather die on our feet than live on our knees. Ash. I think about it every minute of a day, every hour of a year, every second of a day. Can remember that day? Ash. We are young achievers, a youth development based in Soweto. Siabonga. My name is Sepang Scott Lokwale from a royal family. Thank you.
Thank you, young people. Was that the, the applause for the young people? Next on the item, I would like to call Amanda Hedebe to the podium to represent the Morris Isaacson LRC. Come through, Amanda. Good day, Dumelang Sanwanani. My name is Amanda Hatebe Upungan Mashiama Sanjangwe Yamazani. Today I am truly honored and I am truly honored and humbled to welcome you to Morris Isaacs in High School. Namsanja Usugula Pokona Sibungaza Impilo Zabaholi Abacha Abatela Impilo Zabo Uguze Balwele Impundo Ganyan Zilim Zum Tabu. Today we remember. We remember young leaders like Eti Mashinini, Khoto Siatolo, Dan Matonsi, Trofo Mosomo, the young leaders who fought for the recognition of our African language. Today we remember the June 16 of 1976 when a bunch of young students engaged in a peaceful march when they came across police who brutally murdered them and started shooting at young, innocent and, um, and unarmed school children. On this day, Impilo Zabantabasha Zalasega Kepa is a Gunjalo, Abapelanga Moya, Bat Kubegela Pambili, and Chisegele Futayo, Baluela in Tababe Kulel Waguyo, and because of that, Nam Sanjas Patuleli Skogo City, Bai Begile in Dugu Evanta. With all that being said, I welcome you to Morris Isaacs. Thank you, Amanda. Before I go ahead, may I kindly acknowledge the few honorable people in our presence today. Our former principal, Principal Mashile, is in the, in the audience today. <clears throat> We've got both Teacher Mabena. I know Teacher Mabena was the teacher of Abut Pala. Professor Masipa. <laughs> Professor Masipa. <laughs> Professor Masipa, she is one of those who actually the founders of our school. It was first known as Fred Clark, then Mushodi, then Morris Isaacson. So they are the pioneers of our school. May I also, I saw him today, acknowledge and welcome Carlos Lima, all the way from Brazil. He's here with us today. Thank you. So I know this is the moment we've been waiting for.
May you kindly help me invite Professor Chilidzi Marwala to the podium and deliver. Thank you. Thank you. Dumela. Sanibonan. Dimasia. I firstly would like to acknowledge uh, the presence of the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town. Uh, Professor Pakeng. I also would like to acknowledge the, the acting principal, Maisela, and the former principal, and also the learners. Amanda, you have big shoes to fill. The alumni of uh, Modric Isaacson, uh, give yourself a round of applause. Uh, amongst us, we have advocate uh, Mujanku Gumbi. She is sitting there quiet, quietly, not wanting to be noticed. <laughs> and the family of uh, Tieti Masichinini. In in, in a welcoming speech during the South African Music Awards in April 2016, Rifilwe Ramukhase said in a poignant message about the 40th anniversary of June 16, 1976, Soweto Uprising, and I quote, Soweto not only serves as a reminder of the selfless bravery of our youth 40 years ago, but also reminds us that actions motivated by yesterday, taken today, set the course for tomorrow. If one is bold enough, one can change not only the course of history, but the course of the future." Close quote. Rabu Hase's words ring in my mind today here at the Maurice Isaacson Secondary School in this historic township of Soweto, as I delivered the fourth TST Machinini lecture on the fourth industrial revolution. TST Machinini was a student here during the time of the Soweto uprising. At the tender age of 19 years, I was only five years old, despite my white hair. He was the leader of the Soweto uprising 43 years ago. To understand TAT, one needs to understand the political mood of the time. It was the time of black consciousness movement and our great leader, Bantu Steve Biko. It was also the time when the liberation movements like the African National Congress and the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania were facing great challenges. Our leaders such as Robert Sobukwe and Walter Sisulu were in jail. Some such as Oliver Tambo and Potlako Livalo were in exile. The announcement by the then Minister of Education, Dr. Andris Trienech, that black students would learn in Afrikaans sparked what would become the bloodiest uprising in the history of South Africa. It was only a spark because the socio-economic conditions of black people in South Africa was appalling. It was also the time of the implementation of the Bantu stand policy that led to the so-called independent states of Twanskai, Wuputatswana, Venda, and Siskai. This morning as I was coming here, I actually had to remind myself of that period 
I still have an ID of a fictitious country called the Republic of Venda. And this decision of dividing our people into the so-called independent states was nothing but the balkanization of the African people along the ethnic lines. And with that came the consolidation of Bantu education, which was far inferior to the education of white people. The Soweto uprising forced many young people to exile and swelled the ranks of the African National Congress and the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania. And it led to the formation of the Black Consciousness Movement of Azania under the leadership of uh, Dr. Musiwudi Mangena thereby putting the struggle against apartheid on a higher gear. How did such a young man, Tieti Mashinini, lead a revolution that changed the face of resistance against apartheid? To understand this question, one needs to understand Franz Fanon, who stated that, and I quote, each generation must out of relative obscurity, discover its mission. Fulfill it or betray it, close quote. At that time, Tieti Mashinini discovered his mission, which was to liberate his people. He decided to fulfill that mission, not to betray it. Out of the Soweto riots, Soweto became an international name known for its uncompromising and determined purpose to overthrow the apartheid regime. What has now happened to Soweto? As the vice chancellor and principal of the University of Johannesburg, what have we done for Soweto? The University of Johannesburg has invested 1.4 billion rands in our Soweto campus. I think you can give us a round of applause. We have built a world-class primary school on our campus called Funda Ujawule. We have created a world renowned science center for the use by high school students in Soweto. In fact, the University of Johannesburg has even named one of its iconic buildings the Tieti Machinini Building. Furthermore, our university and Growing Up Africa have just completed an innovation center in Soweto, in Devlin, at the cost of 200 million rands. But despite all these investments, education in Soweto is still struggling. The middle class of Soweto is now busing its children to schools in the suburbs for better education. A month ago, Pumla School for the Severely Mentally Handicapped in Orlando West was disrupted. Soweto schools suffer from crises such as drug abuse, stabbings, and many other horrible things that should not be committed by our young people. At times like these, where are the modern TAT machininis? When TAT was a student here, there was no internet. What, one could not suddenly connect with the world through applications such as Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Last month, Soweto became the first township in South Africa to receive fiber internet. The fiber internet means that internet in Soweto will now become faster than some of our most upmarket suburbs. This faster internet 
means that Soweto is being thrust into the fourth industrial revolution. So what is this thing called the fourth industrial revolution? And what does it mean for South Africa and particularly for Soweto? To understand the fourth industrial revolution, we need to understand the first, the second, and the third industrial revolutions. The first industrial revolution happened in England in the 17th century. Given the population size and density, the first industrial revolution should have happened in India or China, but not England. I was a PhD student in England, and every time I used to wander around and I interacted with English people, one thing that used to come to my mind was, how in the world did such people conquer the world? <laughs> it was because the scientific revolution that gave us Newton's laws of motion, the theory of gravitation and thermodynamics did not occur in China or India, but in England that the first industrial revolution happened there. It was because of the centrality of universities such as Oxford and Cambridge that allowed scientific thought to flourish that the first industrial revolution happened in England. The University of Johannesburg must play a role in stimulating scientific thought, innovation, and industrialization right here in Soweto. The first industrial revolution gave us steam engines and the mechanization of production of goods. The first steam train arrived in South Africa in 1860, 60 years after it was first invented. No nation can afford to be 60 years behind. And we have no choice but to accelerate our developmental pace. During this period, when the first industrial revolution was happening in England, a group of people called the Luddites emerged. Their mission was to stop the first industrial revolution. Many of them were arrested. Some of them were hanged. They were defeated and relegated to the dustbin of history. But the first industrial revolution marched on. We cannot stay away from industrial revolutions. The second industrial revolution happened largely in the United States with ideas developed in England by scientists such as Father Day and Maxwell. Father Day realized that if you have something that conducts electricity and you move it, electricity is generated. Asimulowi. To this day, the majority of electricity is generated by moving a conductor next to a magnet. When ESCOM generates electricity, they take coal, they heat it, they, they, they burn it, they have water, and they boil the water, steam comes out, and the steam moves a large conductor that is located next to the magnet. The reverse of that is that once you have electricity and you put electricity to a conductor next to a magnet, it moves. It moves. As <laughs> Now, this is what you call an electric motor. For those of you with young children, uh, with those toys that move around. If you break it apart, you will realize that it is nothing but a magnet and some wires. That's why it moves. And of course, the electric motor became instrumental in many industries, such as our fridges, but it revolutionized the way we made goods and services. When you go to a factory and you see things moving, it is because of the electric motor. When you go to the airport and you see your bag moving towards you, it is nothing but an electric motor. Scientist Maxwell theorized the relationship between electrical forces 
and magnetic forces. And this was the basis of Einstein's theory of relativity. During this period, when the second industrial revolution was coming into place, we were fighting in the battle of Isandwana where we, we won the battle but lost the war. Why did we lose the war? We lost the war because we had not mastered the scientific methods of organizing and enabling society. In the spirit of Tieti Machinini, now it is the time to master the art of scientifically organizing our society to increase economic production as well as social cohesion and unite our people. During the second industrial revolution, a group of people who call themselves the practical man, it can only be men, tried to stop the second industrial revolution, but they too failed, and the second industrial revolution marched on. The third industrial revolution came about because of the invention of semiconductors in the 1950s. These are devices that conduct electricity under certain conditions. These devices gave us a transistor and ushered an electronic age. All your phones are able to do what they do because of transistors. And I can see many of them, many of you carrying uh, these phones and taking my picture. <laughs> However, to this day, in Africa, we do not have a single homegrown computer company, nor a cell phone company, nor a domestic automobile company. In the spirit of Tieti Machinini, now it is the time to transform the landscape of our, our industrial base to tackle the problems of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. <laughs> to paraphrase, the Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg, Professor Njawulon Debele, we were objects of the first, second, and the third industrial revolution, not subjects. We should therefore become subjects rather than objects of the fourth industrial revolution. If we ignore the fourth industrial revolution, we shall become economic slaves and technological colonies. It is imperative that we become equal participants in the fourth industrial revolution. The colonization of our continent by the Europeans was because we were objects of the first and the second industrial revolutions. We can never be the, we can never be the African rejuvenation agents unless we are active agents of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, what is this thing called the fourth industrial revolution? It is the confluence of advancements in the digital space, computer space, robotics, and biological technologies. And it is catalyzed by this discipline called artificial intelligence. About uh, 22 years ago, I went to the University of Cambridge to do a doctorate in artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a technology that makes machines intelligent like human beings are intelligent. They do things that are supposed to be done by human beings. So on your Facebook, when you post a picture and that picture is automatically labeled who the person is, it's because of artificial intelligence. Because Traditionally, you would require somebody to put the name of a person. Now, because of artificial intelligence, it does that automatically. Some of us have devices in our home that we can speak to. Siri is an example. Uh, Google uh, Assist is also another example. Because of artificial intelligence, now aeroplanes, pilots no longer have to do much. It is done by a machine. Of course, a machine can make a mistake. That is why the Boeing 737 MAX collapsed. Because the data, which is 
which is what artificial intelligence worked through, was not as reliable as it was supposed to be. So AI, artificial intelligence, is replacing, I can see uh, this is about to come out. Artificial intelligence is replacing human beings and substituting them with machines. No more than 50 people operate a brewery in Port Elizabeth, which was completed 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, it was the most advanced brewery in the Southern Hemisphere. This brewery produces more beverage than its predecessor that employed 4,000 people. So 50 people now are producing more, brewery, more beverage than the 4,000 people. Here in Johannesburg, my core researcher and I created a machine that can restore a lost voice by using artificial intelligence. This machine is applicable to patients who have lost their voice, voice boxes due to cancer. This machine is placed... <laughs> this machine is placed in the mouth and it tracks the movement of the tongue and based on the movement of the tongue, it synthesizes what the person wanted to say. In this regard, it restores lost voices almost along biblical proportions. <laughs> Yet it is based on pure science. The fourth industrial revolution is changing the world of banking. Recently, Standard Bank laid off 1,500 workers. This is because the fourth industrial revolution is replacing banking branches with online banking. Many of you no longer even visit your branches because you can do everything you used to do in your banks in your phones. People now can send money, manage their accounts on their phones, and they no longer need to go to the bank branches. If we do not participate in the fourth industrial revolution, we shall be relegated to the margins and the dustbins of history. In April last year, three children were killed and others were rushed to the hospital when an abandoned building collapsed in Johannesburg. Mayor Mash Herman Mashaba said this tragedy could have been avoided. In March last year, three people died when a building in Deben collapsed. Again, this tra tragedy could have been prevented. In 2015, the Greystone Drive bridge on top of the M1 highway collapsed, killing two people and injuring many. How do we prevent buildings and bridges from collapsing? We can only prevent buildings from collapsing by using the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. For us, for us to achieve this, let us go back to the lesson in engineering that my grandmother Wochianeo taught me. My grandmother Wochianeo used to make clay pots. And for those of you who know how to make clay pots, you know how difficult that it is. The art of making clay pots is rich in lessons in engineering, such as supply chain management, metallurgy, thermodynamics, and artificial intelligence. Making clay pots can guide us on how we can prevent buildings from collapsing. When my grandmother used to make these clay pots, the first thing that she used to do was to identify the source of good clay. And I know many of the learners here might not know that clay is only found next to the river. You can't find it in dry places. And this whole concept of identifying clay that my grandmother used to do when I was studying engineering, we call it material selection. We even have sophisticated tools to select materials. But my grandmother never had any of those tools. But she knew which clay was good. Then she will deliver this clay to the manufacturing place where she will process it and form it into a pot. A pot is a complicated thing. It has to be round, but it also has to be hollow. Why does it have to be hollow? 
because you need that space to be able to cook. If I ask my engineering students to make a, a clay pot, they ask me about the availability of a software called computer-aided design. <laughs> my grandmother did not even know what computer-aided design was, but she could make great pots. Then the pots are put into the sun so that they can dry. After they are dried, she will put it into the fire so that they can be baked so hot that they look red. Of course, this requires the knowledge of thermodynamics. My grandmother did not know what thermodynamics was all about. Then the fire is allowed to extinguish and the pots are cooled down slowly. Professor Fernando, slowly, not fast. I had to correct him when we were coming here. Cooling the pot slowly is a process called annealing, which is learned in metallurgical engineering. My grandmother did not even know what annealing was about. If the pots are cooled fast, then they are going to, 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 to crack. This process of annealing is such a powerful concept that an artificial intelligent algorithm called simulated annealing was created from it. Simulated annealing is now used to find the shortest distances between two points. Technologies such as Google Maps and GPS in our cars use simulated annealing to be able to tell you the best route to move from one point to another. My grandmother was able to know this annealing process without the need to know what is called the Boltzmann equation. This Boltzmann equation describes the process of annealing, and it was discovered by the Austrian scientist Ludwig Boltzmann. To understand simulated annealing, one needs to understand the Boltzmann equation. But my grandmother had no understanding of Boltzmann equation, let alone know who Boltzmann was. This notion of knowing concepts, such as the practical aspect of annealing, without knowing the theoretical aspect, is what Antonio Gramsci called the organic intellectual. When my grandmother finished cooling these clay pots, she knocked each one of them and listened to it. If it rings for a long time, it is a good pot. If it rings for a short time, it's a bad pot. She will throw it away. Of course, when I was studying engineering, I was taught that if it rings for a long time, it is a lightly damped structure. If it rings for a short time, it is a damped structure. It means some, some, uh, some water is trapped inside. As my grandmother was aging, I realized that she was throwing away good pots. The reason why she was throwing away good pots was because her hearing was deteriorating. She could no longer hear very well. This framework can be used to monitor the safety of buildings and bridges. In this regard, data acquisition devices or sensors are embedded on buildings and bridges, and the data gathered is relayed to the artificial intelligence machine, and this machine analyzes this data, and it decides whether the bridge is of good condition or not, exactly as my grandmother did it, but without using human ear. In my book, Artificial Intelligent Methods for Rational Decision Making, I use this technology of artificial intelligence to predict when patients are about to experience epileptic seizures and be able to inform the doctor to intervene before the person gets into trouble. We have also used this framework in diagnosing images of lungs to determine whether a patient has pulmonary embolism or not, a very dangerous disease. We have used this technique to predict leukemia, a very deadly form of cancer. To conquer the fourth industrial revolution requires the new TAT machine. What are the characteristics of the modern day TAT machine? The person should be very educated. 
Such a person should be an expert in the human, social, and technological sciences all at the same time. The individual should be open-minded and understand that the era of the fourth industrial revolution, critical thinking is more important than memorization of facts. Because all information now is available on the internet. Such a person should understand that problem solving is more important than repeated work. The modern day TLT machinini should realize that creativity is more important than coping other people's ideas. The individual should know that the age when countries economically rose by coping technologies from others is gone. The TAT machinery of today should understand that coordinating with others using techniques such as crowdsourcing is more valuable than individual effort. The person should know that emotional intelligence is useful in the fourth industrial era because teams are more diverse and more creative. Persons and teams should be able to preempt the harmful and unintended consequences of technology. For us to succeed in the fourth industrial revolution era, we should become excellent students who learn continuously. As Isaac Asimov put it, and I quote, education is not something you can finish, close quote. The activists of today should be formidable learners who read, who listen, who write, and constructively reflect all the time. The, uh, their acquisition of knowledge should be broad, spanning the humanities and social sciences, as well as science and technology. The theater machinery of today should not only be driven by ideologies, but by scientific ways of reaching conclusions which is based on hard evidence. The modern day TAT machinery should have a global mindset instead of narrow nationalism. As TAT would have realized, having lived in the rest of the African continent, including Liberia, the economic fortune of South Africa is firmly tied to the fortunes of the rest of the African continent. Unlike Japan, that left Asia economically behind, and its foremost thinker, Yukichi Fukuzawa, proudly proclaimed, and I quote, goodbye Asia, we are leaving you behind, close quote. South Africa cannot afford to leave the rest of the African continent behind. <laughs> Naturally, the modern theater machinery should be cos cosmopolitan. The activist of the fourth industrial revolution should be grounded in the community. Such a person should understand our problems and always seek to solve them. When Google Translate, as it does, is unable to translate from Isi Zulu to English, as it does, such an activist should be at the forefront of finding local solutions and companies that address this deficit. Not too long ago, I went to Google Translate to try to find out what ukuhlanga, uh, lungehlanga means. It thinks it means race does not matter. When Google Maps is unable to pronounce our African street names as it does, the activists of today should be thinking of creating our own local companies to compete with Google Maps. And such companies should create devices with diverse accents, because we have diverse accents in South Africa. The modern day activist must be innovative. These activists should understand that research leads to innovation, which leads to intellectual property, which leads to products, which leads to better quality of life. We can achieve all these attributes by demanding good education. 
which is precisely what TNT Machinini fought for in 1976 near Bonga, the Real We are in the presence of greatness, isn't it? Young people, I hope you are listening and internalize everything and take everything that was said here. You are in the presence of greatness. Now I like singing, even though I don't have the greatest singing voice. <laughs> and opportunities and occasions like these, they come once in a lifetime. So just bear with me. Someone somewhere there will help me. Because, thank you, Professor. Um, as we say, we are celebrating the Hanka. The Hanka. Ikawe. Again, people who were very brave. So I think this song, even if we just sing one verse or maybe Rechabe Lechai too, let's just sing it anyway. Ibuaka Magwala. Remagwala a church, a church, lemura, oh, ya runa.
is poetry by the Honorable, Honorable Maishe Maponya. Can we give him a round? In the body, wounds, white on black, black on white, black on black, wounds, wounds in the mind, minds are lost, aching for the rays as the new pastor led long. In the soul, ancestral lineage lost in pursuit of heavenly bondage, forever in hell, indelible scars, wounds, wounds, healing, healed, endured, yet forgotten the mark of the distance traveled. Wounds sustained yesterday endured today leprous tomorrow wounds. That's a 1994 poem. Twenty fifteen, we bleed. They bleed our patience to smithereens as we carry the cross to the pole, never been intent on crossing swords, though our pounded patience is mangled in confused surprise when they falter and shamelessly blunder. Have they not pleaded this child they call democracy was young? Meanwhile, they milk the cow till it bleeds. They besieged the cross carriers to tell the story and pray and wait while patiently we watch with disbelief and horror how under the tables of skunk politicians with craggy hanging pot bellies, the pages of the Constitution are torn apart. These rulers without shame bleed the patience of those bristling faces were crushed at midnight after carrying their cross to the voting box full of hope stolen. The last poem, can I have some water? Please, please let me come. The last poem. This one is dedicated to Michael Komapi. When a five-year-old school-going little love falls into a school pit latrine on his first day of schooling, the doors of learning have shut in the faces of children. The skak and the land. The skak and the land. Now, you're not going to sit there and keep quiet. You're going to have to join me 
in the old tradition of call and response. And when I say das kak and the land, you say das kak and the land. When textbooks are fed to crocodiles in Limpopo River, knowing they never had teachers, feces must fly all over the faces of politicians held by people, for they had deep that's cock in the land, that's cock in the land. When teachers' unions throw tantrums in protections of members who sell teaching posts and align themselves with the ruling elite whose pockets are lined with entrapments of honey bait for protection. That's cock and the land. That's cock and the land. And when exam papers leak like porous borders for illegal immigrants, while no one takes the fall in the cross-border pit latrines of bribes and party scams. The skunk in the land, the skunk in the land. Hankering over presidential powers enshrined in the mystical Bible come constitution till to rule till Jesus comes to draw boundaries for would-be despots in ruling elite gubs and fashionable debs, the skunk in the land, the skunk in the land. Cooking a fake arms deal commission to taste like fat water's quirky costs, unclear nuclear daylight looters cookie jar made in Putin's land like a Russian roulette pudding, the skunk in the land, the skunk in the land. It will be bloody muddy when the bull terriers of Dubai feast on the carcasses of a shattered dream of the rainbow people after an empty long night walk of freedom mirage, the skunk in the land, the skunk in the land. We've been promised an elusive Aluta sunshine, sunrise with the nimble-footed Dubaians who failed to smell the stink left behind their tails when the captured president and his chummies are stripped of the luxuries stolen in the midnight journey of their belly dancers of the scavenge, the skunk and the land, the skunk and the land. Human Rights Month or not, repeat of a bizarre history of five-year-olds in Bizana and Mucha village of Toyando, Mam Ketwa's little love lost in another pit latrine scam, while child of Madala is electrocuted like there were death squads in schoolyards boosted by democratic Dispensations, the skunk in the land, the skunk land. Now these poems are contained in this collection of poetry called the skunk in the land. Unfortunately, there's only four copies, and it retails at 150. The four who are lucky and who've got some bit of money, I need it. Thank you. Before we go ahead, may I quickly acknowledge the following guests amongst us. We've got Judge President Dustin Mlambo. Yeah. Advocate 
Mudise Koza. And they are also our alumni. And Jeff Makoba, alumni class of 80s. The Satu Soweto Branch Deputy Chairperson, Comrade Ndlovu. And also, may I acknowledge and welcome Osria Piera and Dada Piera. So, as we move along, the moment of the moment of the moment we've been waiting for. to be here Dumela Mbakhae Tsu Kali Dumedi Sasanbona Ni Molweni Before I greet any of you I'm sure you know that I'm from Cape Town so it took a long time to get here my trip started last night at around half past five and I only arrived at uh, 12.50 today and so I have to say thank you to my sons who are at home watching on TV. They want me to thank them for taking me up and down to the airport with the flights changed, canceled, and then having to buy new tickets. So I had to buy three tickets to get here today, but I'm here. So thank you to Sulu and Musa. If it were not for Tulu Fellow and Musa, I wouldn't be here because they drove me up and down as the flights were canceled. So I'm grateful. It's good to be a mother. But I also have to say thank you. I'm wearing a bow tie today that's um, made by a 3D printer that's designed by one of our undergraduate students at UCT. We at UCT are not just graduating, producing graduates. We produce leaders, professionals, industry leaders and entrepreneurs, and people who are just entrepreneur, who have an entrepreneurial mindset. Entrepreneurship at UCT is huge. We are don't, not just innovating, we, inter, we, we, we create, we invent, we commercialize, and so on Thursday, whilst we were looking at our students who would be representing us at the national, I decided to buy the bow tie from one of our students and other things that our students are doing before they go and hit us nationally, competing with other universities. Thank you very much, Professor Marwala, for your talk. The program director said today we are celebrating and indeed we are celebrating. But celebration for us as South Africans is something that we do easily. We are very good at it. We are experts. That's just what we do. We do it very well. But as we celebrate, I want us to pause today because we do celebration well. We also do critique very well, critique of the other. We do critique of the other very well. Today, 
I want us to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, since June, 9, June 16, 1976, what's different today in terms of what made the young people hit the streets? What's different today? It's okay to dream, but first we must understand where are we today in relation to that which was in contestation in 1976 that brought out young people into the streets. How far are we that? And that's the language issue. And I'm calling us to a point of reflection because if we do not reflect, we'll find ourselves in the same place many years from now. Here we are today, Maurice Isaacson, celebrating 2016. None of us is asking why the proceedings are only in English. Why? The only things we say in African languages are ceremonial. We use our languages ceremonially. There's no meaning. We don't give content in our languages. We don't even pause to ask why. Why? Maybe because it's not Afrikaans. Today, I want us to pause and talk about the language of true freedom. What is that language of true freedom? I'm going to do that from my area of comfort, which is mathematics. And I'm going to talk about the language of freedom. How do we move from language as a problem to language as a, resor and as a resource? And I'm going to do that, doing that, ask us to do that in the context of mathematics, teaching and learning. And I do that because Professor Marwala has just talked about the uh, fourth industrial revolution. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter how much we appreciate, we jump up and down when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution. If we don't have our mathematics in place, we will be left behind. Well, here it is. At best, we will be users. We will be users. We will not be creators. So we can talk about artificial intelligence and the bots and whatever, we'll import them. Someone else will do the work. We will just use them. Not many of us pause to ask where the technology that's on our cell phone that we flaunt comes from. We're happy to be users. Well, if we do not get our mathematics education together, we will talk about the fourth industrial revolution. At best, we will be users and boast about being users and what you use and where it comes from. We will never be, be creators. And that's why I want us to pause with the celebration and critique ourselves and not critique the other. We are in power. We are in power, it's 25 years. Time to critique the other is over. It's time to do for ourselves. So, our country has got 11 official languages. We have 11 official languages in this country and our, and our educa language and education policy recognizes those 11 official languages as possible to use for teaching and learning. Our policy recognizes multilingualism as a resource. The fact that we don't use it doesn't matter. Policy has said 11 official languages, you can use any one of the languages for, le for learning and teaching in schools. You're not restricted. In fact, you can have a school saying, we want Isizul. Not even a school. You can have some children in the school, some learners in the school choosing a particular language of learning and teaching. And I think as long as they get up to 35, the provincial education department is obliged to make sure that it happens. This language policy was pronounced in 1997. Schools also have to choose their language of learning and teaching. Parents, oh, through, children through their parents choose their, their preferred language of learning and teaching. Schools choose, and schools, uh, school governing bodies are required to state their plan for promoting multilingualism. 
Not only school governing bodies in township schools or in village schools, across the country. Everyone, all the school governing bodies are required to do that. That's our language policy. People look at it all over the world and I tell them, this is our language policy and they say, wow, how progressive. Well, today we're gonna ask, is that progressive? But before I get there, let me pause a little bit on multilingualism because many of us in this hall are multilingual. We speak more than one language, we can write more than one, we can read more than one. But actually in this country, the fact that you speak nine languages is not seen as valuable. When I go elsewhere in the world and I tell them I speak nine languages, they stand up and they say, wow, how amazing. But here yeah, it's not special. And the reason it's not special is because the languages do not have capital, and I'll talk to that. But here's the thing. It should be valuable. More than, more, the fact that we speak more than one language, we've got fluency in more than one language, is recognized in research as, as an advantage. People think it is a disadvantage, it impedes learners from learning a new language. No, it doesn't. Research tells us that being multilingual does not impede learning. It doesn't impede mathematics learning. In fact, it supports it. Research tells us that learners' home languages are a resource for learning and learning mathematics at that. Research tells us that children in multilingual education tend to develop better thinking skills. And this is research, not just from South Africa, from multilingual countries across the world. It tells us that children who speak, who have fluency in more than one language, tend to develop better thinking skills. So the fact that we are multilingual, actually, we should be the people who are sought after. In this, in this world, there are, countries, there are countries where, when they recruit, if you speak more than one language, that's taken as valuable and you get paid more. Because the assumption is that you'll be able to do more because you can use more languages, especially in the public sector. Here, we don't care. In fact, if you don't speak English, probably even Afrikaans, you don't even stand a chance to be accepted into the army or the police service to train in the army. If you went and applied to the army and said to them, I want to be a, a soldier or a police and I can't speak Afrikaans or English, I doubt that anyone will take you. This is 25 years after democracy. We don't have anyone to blame. We are in power and we have a very progressive language policy. We're going to ask why. And my view, the reason why comes from the fact that language is political. And I think we as South Africans haven't yet grasped the political nature of language. You see, language was central to the ideology of apartheid in South Africa. It was used to classify, to segregate, and polarize. It did that in homeland system. It did, it did that within the country. Schools were separated according to language, primary schools. Language is political. The underdevelopment of African languages during apartheid was part of a larger social engineering project. It's not as if the African languages did not develop because Africans were lazy or they were not interested. It was part of a larger social engineering project. And the language of learning and teaching issue, of course, was a dominating factor in opposition to the apartheid system of Bantu education. And we know, we're here celebrating 1976, June 16. My view is, we still haven't moved much because we're not focusing on what the problem is. You see, the political role of language is so big that language has got implications of how social goods are or have to be distributed. 
And social goods are anything that a group of people believes to be a source of power, a source of status, or a source of worth. For example, your fluency in English often dictates whether you're gonna get a job, which job, and where. Well, let me tell you something. It's not only about jobs. It also goes to whether you get the flat or not. It does, it is. When you phone in Santa and you want to rent a flat, they don't have to ask who are you, where you come from. The way you speak English <laughs> tells them. It tells the whole story of you. Because when we speak, when we speak or write, we create a political perspective about ourselves. We use language to project ourselves as certain kinds of people engaged in certain kinds of activity. We may not do this deliberately, but it happens all the time. I'm standing here in front of you right now. You are making conclusions about me just by listening to me. And note, that just was picked deliberately to make an impact, which is political. Use of language. We, we, you use language to say who we are, the kinds of activities we are engaged in, and what kinds of people we are. People draw conclusions about us. So you, you phone to rent a flat, the landlord can decide, hmm, this sounds like a KZN accent. Trouble, no. <laughs> they don't have to tell you that. They don't have to tell you that. They can just say, the flat is taken. It's no longer available. Just by listening to either your accent or how your English comes across. Language being used. And that happens all the time. So the political nature of, the political role of language is with us all the time. And therefore, decisions about which language to use, how and for what, for what purpose, whether it's in teaching or in communication or when you give a speech, are not just for communicative purposes. They are always political. Language is not benign. It is not innocent. It is political. It is political at the macro level of structures, but it is also political at micro level of interactions and relationships. So I'm not surprised that despite a very progressive policy, and I did research, I do research, those of you who know me, I do research in mathematics education and I focus specifically in multilingual mathematics classrooms where children learn mathematics in a language that's not their own. And my research has shown that teachers in black schools in South Africa prefer to teach mathematics in English. Yes. But before you blame them, I'll go, I'll go to that now. Learners in our black African schools in this country also prefer to be taught mathematics in English. Even though they are not fluent in it, even though they are still learning the language, they want English. Why should they not? They see you at home clapping hands for the three-year-old who's going to preschool who's reciting sentences in English. They see you at church giving value to people who've got fluency in English. And they want to feel valuable in church as well. They want you to ask them to come and speak as well. And so they want fluency in English. They are not thinking mathematics. Even though you ask them what language do you want to be taught mathematics in, they are not thinking language. They are thinking access to English rather than access to mathematics. So they want access to those social goods, social goods that they see as important for them to get jobs, to get higher education, to get status, to be regarded seriously in society, not to be shamed or anything like that. So it is not trivial, it's political. So te when teachers say they want English, they're not stupid. Many teachers aren't doing that. They think they're helping the learners because they know how society will treat them if they're not fluent in English. And society 
I mean, just even us here, black people in the hall. So language is political. And of course, in our country, the debates on language, language of instruction or medium of instruction or language and teaching and learning tend to create dichotomies that are not helpful. And I will just now talk up to those dichotomies. Because those dichotomies also help, they sort of delay us from dealing actually with the real problem. But first let me say, why is there a seeming disconnection between what research says? Research said, says children, is children who start, who learn their home language first, become fluent in it, learn in it for the first nine years of schooling, will learn a second language better, will develop thinking skills, will do this and that and that. Research says that. Research says multilingualism is valuable, it develops thinking skills and so on and so forth. Why is it that on the ground, people are not going for home language and people are not going for multilingual? People just want English only. Why? And for me as a researcher, that was an interesting question. And here's my finding. This is because research on language and learning is often framed by a cognitive perspective which sees language only as a tool for thinking and communication. Oftentimes people think that's, what, that's all what language is. It's just a tool for thinking and communication. They forget that this thinking and communication happens in a context, a context that is political. Okay, so research, research, most of the research does that. But language choices of teachers, learners, and parents, black African parents and in black African schools who prefer English are informed by a social political perspective, which considers the political nature of English that says, well, if English is this dominant, you better get access to it, because if you don't, you'll be left behind. You won't get access to that, you won't get access. You'll be excluded even from political discourse. Because even our toy toy meetings are in English. <laughs> so language is not benign. It's a product and a career of power. So what we have, therefore, in South Africa, with this progressive language policy, we have a multilingual policy, but monolingual practice in our schools today. And not only in our schools, in our churches, in many places, we've got monolingual practice. So multilingual policy, as progressive as it seems, and we say it's progressive because it says 11 official languages, choose whichever one you like, but actually there is no choice in this language policy because it assumes that teachers and learners in multilingual classrooms in this country, together with their parents, are somehow free of economic, political, and ideological constraints and pressures when they make language choices. They say choose, as if things are all equal, and you just choose. So this policy of ours is very problematic because it seems to be taking a positivist view of language, one that suggests that all languages can be free of cultural and political influences. It ignores the hegemony or the power of English in our space. And so the choice that our language policy offers our learners, our teachers, and parents in schools is a false choice. There is no choice. It looks good on paper, and it makes politicians feel good. They did the right thing. They launched a multilingual policy but it's doing nothing on the ground. It's a false choice. And I'm saying, as long as we go with this false choice, we can forget about African languages becoming anything better. And you can ask, if Sieti Mashinini were here, was here, what would he do? What would he say? Would we have another toy toy? Here's the thing, not all languages are equally powerful. Language is a powerful tool, but not all languages are equally powerful. We are dealing here 
with the hegemony of English, which is not just national, it's international. And so we've got to, when we think about this choice and how we work in our schools, we've got to think about the fact that the hegemony of English is international. And monolingual teaching, because in some provinces, MECs have decided that schools, foundation phase, every child must be taught in their language, in their home language. And by the way, they make this decision. This decision affects only children in, in black schools, in, in township and rural schools. If you want to move away from that decision, you just go to a former Model C school or a private school, you are out. They are only in township and rural areas. So here's the problematics of this. By the way, our politicians think they're doing a good thing. Every foundation faced learner must learn in their home language. They, they produce workbooks and they say, no English. Teachers are having workbooks in the African languages. It sounds progressive, it sounds decolonial. Here's the problem. It is not progressive. First of all, it's not consistent with our multilingual policy and actually can be seen as discriminatory. Because what it says is that if you have money, you can, buy your, you, you can buy access to English. You just take your child. That's why teachers teach in the township school, but their children go to another school. They're buying English and other things. All of us, when, because we haven't focused. It's not just teachers, nurses, all of us. I do that, you do that, everyone does that. All of us are doing that. Anyone whose life becomes better, you've got a little more money, you take your child out of the township school. And we don't want to talk about this. Okay, white people are not in the room. Today we can talk. <laughs> so it's discriminatory because it means if you are poor, if you're poor, one of the punishments that you get is that you get foundation phase in your home language. And listen, I'm not saying it's bad to get foundation phase teaching in your home language. I'm saying in the way that it happens, it's bad. And I will explain how we should do it. I'll make a proposal. The way it happens, it brings another burden on only poor people. The middle class and the upper middle class are safe and they will have access to the fourth industrial revolution that we make so much noise about. The majority will not even see it. We've got to make peace with the fact that in this country, in this world of ours, access to English means access to social goods. Let's not pretend that doesn't exist. We've got to make peace with that. But making peace with that doesn't mean that you only teach in English. Because if you teach only in English, you're also suggesting that learners are not allowed to be who they are. Then we go back to apartheid, where in township schools, certainly when I was at school, we were told there were times you are not allowed to say anything in your home language, you'll get punished. That's also problematic in a multilingual country such as ours with a progressive multilingual policy. And this is what brings the dichotomies in the debates on language of learning and teaching in our country today. The dichotomies are between people say to me, so tell us, now that you are saying this, tell us, what should we teach in, in English or in home language? When I try to explain, they say, no, 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 don't explain, choose one. No, we are not choosing one. I'm here today to say we cannot choose one, and I'll tell you why. But let me get on with the dichotomy. So this is the dichotomy. You can't just choose one. We are a multilingual country, and multilingualism has to be understood properly. The second dichotomy is that people say, so what do you want us to do? To focus on developing fluency in English or to focus on developing mathematical proficiency? When I'm in class and the teachers, uh, I'm watching teachers and they're giving low level maths tasks that are not very challenging. And I give them a problem and say, you're introducing linear programming, give them this problem. And the teacher says, no, 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 there's too much English. These kids don't know English. I can't give them that. What do you want me to do, prof? And I say to them, but you're disadvantaging our kids. 
You're giving them low-level mathematics. It's just as good as no mathematics at all. They don't get to experience the power of mathematics. And so this dichotomy of the fluency and Allah tend to it. The other dichotomy is the dichotomy of, of saying, well, teach only in home language, uh, or if you teach in home languages, you are showing commitment to the development of the African languages. And this is what our politicians are doing. Some of them, they say, foundation phase, do this. And then, if you teach in, in, in English, you are against the development of African languages. English is anti, anti, anti. Meantime, people are taking their children to former Model C and private school. And they're busy telling us that this is the colonial dichotomy. It's very problematic. Home language equals to de a, a decolonization. English equals to being colonized. These dichotomies are not helpful. And I'm saying these dichotomies create an impression that the use of African languages in teaching and learning and the use of English are or must be in opposition. They create this idea that they must be in opposition, must choose one or the other because they are fighting. And I'm saying our multilingual policy, actually, what it's calling for, our multilingual policy, it is calling for a holistic view of multilingualism and a multilingual learner. That's where the politicians didn't drive it to. I'm saying, let's keep this multilingual policy, but let's understand what it's, what it's doing. It's calling for a holistic view of multilingualism and a multilingual learner. An understanding that, or a view that, under, that says, a multilingual is not a sum of two or more co complete or incomplete monolinguals. The fact that I speak five or nine languages doesn't mean I'm a collection of monolinguals. You're not a collection of monolinguals. I don't speak English like a first language speaker and I'm not interested in being that. I'm not a collection of multilinguals. M multilinguals, multilinguals. We, multilingual people, are like high headlers in athletics. The people who blend two types of competencies. High headlers in athletics, the people who do headling. They master, they have the competency of high jumping and that of sprinting. A high headler is never put on the same competition with a sprinter. But a high headler has to be able to sprint and jump at the same time. That's what we do as multilinguals. We have, we have, the, a, a, a multilinguals, we have the coexistence and constant interaction of the many languages in us. And this coexistence produces a different but complete language system. So I'm not like a first language English speaker. At this stage, I'm not even like a first language Setswana speaker. But I bring the competencies of Setswana, English, Isizul, Isitkos. The Africans sometimes, we blend them. They produce a complete something. And we in this country treat multilinguals as a collection of monolinguals. And so we think an implementation of our, our language policy means that you force a monolingual education at a particular level and you, pr you jump to another monolingual education to English at, a at another level. I'm saying that doesn't work. And that's discriminatory to poor, poor learners. And what I'm arguing for there, therefore, is that today, as I said, I want to make a case. I want to make a case for a multilingual approach to mathematics teaching and learning. We have to make peace with the fact that we are not a multilingual country, we are not a monolingual country, we are a multilingual country. We bring all these linguistic competencies, we, they are contained in individuals. That may be unique, but that might be our competitive edge. And we've got to own it. And so we've got to ask different questions. Rather than say, tell me, which language do I choose, English or Setswana, or English or African language? Let's ask different questions. And let's say, how can we teach mathematics in a multilingual classroom 
to ensure that learners are sufficiently challenged mathematically and interested in learning mathematics. We've got to ask the question, how can we draw on the diversity of languages present in our classrooms, English as well as the learners' home languages, to provide the language support that our learners so desperately need? We've got to ask, how can we draw on the learners' home languages to ensure a focus on, the developing, or on developing mathematical proficiency whilst they are still developing fluency in English? In my view, those are the questions we should ask. Not a question that says, choose one. Why should I choose one? And if we ask those questions, I think we can have progress. So, I asked those questions many years ago. As, as, if you go to mamukheti.com, you'll get a journey of my research and you'll get a sense of when I started asking those questions because my journey, the journey of my research started elsewhere. So check out mamukheti.com or follow me or on at Fab Academic and we will direct you to the website. I asked these questions and then I also remember earlier I said also the way you look at language and the way you look at multilinguals matter. I thought to be able to answer these questions and make sure that they help us in our country to make progress, first we must have a holistic view of multilingual learners and not regard them as a collection of, multi of monolinguals. And monolingual view of multilinguals sees them as incomplete monolinguals. We've got to regard them as we've got to see it as holistic. And secondly, we've got to understand language as a resource. And understand that for a resource to be useful, it must be both visible and invisible. It must be both visible and invisible. And let me explain. Just imagine you come into a class of young people who have never used a scientific calculator. They've never seen it. You give them scientific calculators in class. The first thing they'll do, they'll fiddle with the calculator. They'll try to press buttons to see what happens. At that point, it is not useful. It's not a resource. They are just exploring it. It is the focus. Until they know how to use it, you start giving them problems to use it. And they discover, oh, this calculator can even draw graphs. Now, at some stage, the calculator stops being the fascination and the drawer of attention. It starts being the tool. It's there, they know it's the calculator, but they're not focusing on it as the tool. They use it to do something with it. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Language, I'm saying in this approach, our aim is to work with language to that extent in the multilingual context. So I came to my research with that idea that if I'm talking about language as a resource, I've got to understand that it's got to be visible and invisible so that language itself doesn't become the fascination. We don't keep stopping in the maths class to say your grammar is wrong or to say the way you used split infinitives is wrong. We've got to make that irrelevant. But the way you make it irrelevant is by making language transparent. And making language transparent, you must stop making it a problem. And I'll tell you how we did it in, our, in, 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 my, in my research. But, but that's sort of when we started, I think, this is the theoretical underpinnings. What's going to help us explore these questions that, that I asked, the new questions that I thought we should ask new questions? We need a multilingual approach to teaching and learning mathematics and other subjects. We cannot keep thinking that we've got to teach only in one language. And if you think about it, actually, if you introduce the multilingual approach to teaching and learning, you will become more marketable. Anyway, you didn't get it. I'll, go, I'll get there. I'll get to you. <laughs> now, the guiding principles of this multilingual approach to mathematics uh, uh, teaching and learning is that in this context, language, not just English, the learners' home languages as well as English, they are used deliberately, proactively, and strategically.
They are not just used opportunistically. You don't go on teaching and suddenly Sipo doesn't understand and you say, Sipo, do you want me to say it in Zulu? As if you are shaming Sipo. Or Sipo has to say, I didn't get it, ma'am. Can you say it in Zulu? And then you say it in Zulu. Because now Sipo has to keep uh, announcing that she di he didn't get the English. We are not talking about that opportunism. We're talking about being proactive, being deliberate, and being strategic. And this is a context where English and home languages operate together equally. All written texts both are, are both in, in English and the learners' home languages. And here I argue for multilingual textbooks or bilingual textbooks that no textbook in this country should come only in English. They should be in both languages. And some, some publisher one year had me and produced foundation-faced textbooks in, 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 in two languages different. Uh, unfortunately, the department didn't take them up. It became costly, and so they stopped. Our politicians thought you do one language, monolingual, and then you jump to another language. It doesn't work. Written texts are in, in both languages of the learner and English. Learners can use any language, English or their home language. And, and you also, and I have to emphasize this because of my background, you don't just focus on language if it's in the mathematics classroom. You also make sure that children have interesting and challenging tasks that motivate them to study and use mathematics. I mention this because I don't want you to get a sense that I'm saying if you correct the language issue, you've corrected everything. The mathematics has got to be on point two. So this, this multilingual approach is not about just about just teaching only in African languages. It's not about teaching only in English. This multilingual approach is not about developing terminology in one language or the other. I'm working in a mathematics classroom, and I'm saying we're going to call on calling logarithm a logarithm because actually that's not the source of the problem in, when you teach mathematics. The fact that I say triangle, that's not the source of the problem. That makes children not perform. This multilingual approach to teaching mathematics is about using language as a transparency source to make mathematics accessible to multilingual learners. It's about developing learners' fluency in mathematics, and it's about developing learners' mathematical understanding. And it's about comprehension rather than just terminology. We had, if you've been around long enough, you'll know that our government in 1998, when we still had the Department of Arts of arts, culture, science, and technology. It used to be one department, if you are young, my 2000. It used to be one department. Now, it's now, it, it now is separate. When they had that, they developed what they called uh, uh, mathematics dictionaries. Spent a lot of money. And me and my students, I was a professor at VETS at that time, we critiqued this work. And I, and I, and I said, this work is not going to produce what it think what it, it thinks it wants to produce. Because the task, the challenge, is not terminology, it's comprehension. And indeed, not only have we forgotten that some money was spent on, on, on multilingual dictionaries, we have forgotten the amount of money that we spent on developing them. Uh, when we, the scholars who do the work on the ground, were unfortunately not heard. But how will this multilingual approach work? Is there, is there a problem? OK. It's because I can hear this. It's, it's, I have to ask, I mean. OK. So how it works is that written text, tasks, Tasks, tests, exams are in both English and the learner's home language. Learners in class communicate in any language that they feel comfortable in. Tasks must focus on what the teacher wants the learners to know and do and learn about the mathematics rather than the grammar of the English. And tasks must be varying quality, that's mathematics. And but think about it, when, when, when matri our matriculants write exams, nobody critiques this. There's a group of learners in our country who get what I'm talking about. They get question papers, 
in English and Afrikaans. Many Africans learn us. Their parents have chosen that their children will learn in English. They take them to English schools. But in the exam, they have an advantage. Because they have the exam paper, they can flip to Afrikaans, and then they flip to English. They don't have to announce that they don't know this or they want it. They can flip. Okay, I'm saying, can we have that flipping throughout, in the textbook, in the test, for our black learners? <laughs> now, not only in the exam. Okay, let me pause here because there are many people who are, who have been, have been on this. My, the first paper I published on this was in 2008. And the reason it's not being heard is because some professor in another university comes, who doesn't even speak nine languages, African languages, right? Comes and says, uh, we go to Archisville, we are going to give learners a test in English, and then we give them a test in their home language and see how they perform. And then, of course, the children perform badly in the African languages. And then they say, you see, you can't do this thing. Now, let me tell you why it doesn't work. You can't teach children in English, right, in English only, or even if you are code switching. And in the exam, you give them a monolingual te test that's in, in their home language only. They have never seen, they have never seen a triangle in Zulu. Now suddenly you want them to write an exam. What are you saying? They don't do these things at home. So don't make us fool. So, so people, people in power who are in the room, critique these things. Because then that becomes the research that says we cannot have the mul multilingual uh, teaching and learning. I critique Professor Webb who has made that argument, and his work, his work is published, he's from the University of Pretoria. I critique that work. You cannot do that. I'm saying, you start with the teaching, the, you make it multilingual. You give them in both languages, in English and their home language. You carry on in the test, you do the same. In the exam, you do the same. And of course, I can hear you asking, how will it work in Soweto? My research, we, we collected data here in Soweto, we worked with classrooms in Soweto and in the East Rand. Uh, back before I became famous, you didn't follow me, but I was here. <laughs> and the largest number of languages in one class that we had was five languages, five home languages in one class. And what we do, everything, written text, they have in English and their home languages. They sit in groups, we teach. The teachers have to be multilingual. That's why black teachers are very important. Yes. They are valuable, valuable. The children are grouped. They choose. Do I want to sit in the Setswana in a group or in the Zulu group? Children in the township speak many languages. Some of them are Zulu, but they go to the Setswana group. They've got a paper that's written in Zulu and English. They want to be with the Zulu group. It's fine. So we are not developing homelands in the classroom before people tell you that's what we are doing. We are not doing that. Children going to any classroom, they can talk across. They, we made them, we did this study over two years. We video recorded the lessons. We interviewed the learners. And let me tell you, the first time we did this, and of course we promised learners uh, anonymity and all, and so I can't tell you the schools and so on. When we interviewed the learners after spending time in their classroom, we, f we start first two weeks we do this, and then a teacher who they know not a researcher so that they don't have to think they have to be smart. The first question that the interviewer asked them is, you had researchers in your class in the last two weeks. What were they doing? What was different? And it's amazing what happened because none of the learners said we were having math problems in Zulu, none of them. All of them said, either they said, we were dealing with this problem of electricity. We were figuring out, is it cheap if you go for the coupon system or if you stay on the meter? We, we, we figured out, and actually, we found out that what's cheap is this or that. Oh, it actually doesn't matter. It, it depends on how much electricity you use per month. So you must first check that. The learners told us about the mathematics they were doing until the researcher says, but I hear that you were doing things, there were things given to you in Zulu. And they said, oh yes, and that. 
And what we are trying to do is because we worked in this experiment to try to make language transparent, that it's there, but it doesn't attract their attention, that their attention remains on the mathematics and not the language. had to do a lot of work because material doesn't exist in, bi in dual languages. Mathematics material doesn't exist. There is a project that we worked with, the home language project that runs, was running around here in Johannesburg, but ran out of money and so they stopped operating. We collected data, as I said, in Soweto, in the East Rand, and the school in Parktown, a primary school in Parktown. We worked with children, grade two, grade three, grade four, grade 10, grade 11, we didn't go to grade 12 because they're occupied with exams, but we went as far as grade 11 to see how does this multilingual approach to mathematics teaching and learning work. And we are convinced that if we do that, we will improve learners' participation in mathematics. What we didn't do is check whether that improves performance, but what we checked is how does it improve mathematical, first of all, their mathematical interactions in class? And how do they, that interaction differ when you don't have a multilingual approach to teaching? And we realize that when you don't have a multilingual approach to teaching, children don't talk much because they are, they are locked only into speaking to in English only. The tasks are low level. The teachers are scared to give them high level, cognitive level tasks because they think they will not be able to handle them because there's too much language in them. And children themselves, even if they are put in groups, if they are only limited to one language, English, they don't do, they don't do that. And then we figured none of them wants to do it in African languages. We have to make peace, use multilingual, both languages so that the children do not feel that they are denied access to English and they do not feel that using their home languages in their classrooms is a sin. They must see it as a value, as a resource, and they can then go and see it also in the exam, which it can be a resource. Our view is that this change in learner participation and interest in mathematics is important and we need it in the country. Hence, we believe that arguing for the multilingual approach to mathematics teaching and learning is important. In closing, let me say this, and this is my last argument. I'm talking about mathematics teaching and learning, but basically the bigger thing I'm making is that the bigger argument is that our African languages have no value. If you like, you can say they do not have capital you cannot exchange them for any kind of capital. You know them, but they mean nothing. How do we change that? And my view is that we've got to do something proactive that will serve our country, but also make sure that our languages are valued. You don't do it cosmetically. Here's the thing. We have people, social workers, we have doctors, we have people who will work in the public who will serve the majority of people in this country who are multilingual and black. And some of them are not fluent in English. But we train professionals, we train doctors, social workers, teachers, and many people who will serve in our society who can speak one African language. That's the failure of our political, of our politics, of our politicians, let me put it that way that you put in language policy, you don't put other things in place to make it work. What we need to do is we need to make sure that anyone who's trained, who does, who's trained into being a professional in the public sector has to be required to learn at least one African language. We at UCT have a requirement for every student who's studying to become a medical doctor to pass easy course. You don't graduate. You don't graduate as a medical doctor at UCT if you haven't passed Isikosa. You can pass everything. You can pass everything with distinction. You don't graduate. 
We do it with doctors because we feel that they're going to be saving our people. They need to be able to speak the African language. My view is that we've got to do with teachers, we've got to do it with social workers, we've got to do it with everyone who's going to serve the public. Because what's the point? And let me tell you, if you do this, this is what will happen. First of all, we're going to, our number one problem is going to be we don't have enough teachers of African languages. Nice problem. We want that problem. We want that problem. We're going to have a problem that says we don't have enough. Yes, let's have that problem and then we start training enough. As we speak, many universities have closed down their African languages departments. We are here celebrating June 16. Many universities don't even have a department of African, they don't even teach an African language as a major. I was interviewing uh, some students uh, for a top uh, one, one uh, scholarship to go overseas. And I won't mention Professor Marwala, the name of the university. But one of the graduates who came, who wants to do a master's or a PhD in some university overseas, has got on their transcript, they are not black, they've got on their transcript that they learned uh, an African language. And so I engage them. I do that all the time, if they write, you know. So I engage them. And, and uh, the student said, uh, I can't speak it, Prof. I said, how come? And she said, you see, Prof, in my university, we were taught this language in English. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's what happens in univers many universities. Teach an African language in English. In this country, and, and, uh, and, and that's a problem. Because what happens is that the people who teach the African language, they themselves can't even speak it. Yes. Because you can learn about a language, you can learn to speak a language, you can learn to teach in a language, and you can learn about the language. So are they teaching about the language or are they teaching their language? But, but we are here today celebrating June 16. It doesn't mean anything if we still have this situation. We've got to challenge ourselves, and we are challenging ourselves at UCT. We started with doctors, and we believe that it's going to spread. If it spreads, we'll have a demand for African languages. African languages will start being valued. Suddenly, when we interview teachers, we'll ask one of the questions that Satu will be interested in will be, how many languages can you speak? Which are those languages? At the moment, it is irrelevant how many languages you speak, even if you are coming to teach in a multilingual school. We've got to make it relevant. Nobody is going to do it for us. We've got to do it for ourselves. Thank you very much. Before Professor Mamukheti delivered her speech, in our presence, we are honored to acknowledge and welcome one of our alumni, Judge Boise Mba. Welcome, sir. So this time, I'm just going to hand over to my colleague, Tato uh, Silo will take over for a short while for this upcoming uh, item. Thank you. Tato. Yeah. Great. Um, good afternoon, Bomele Bontat. Can you hear me? 
I'm gonna need the mic. Okay. No, Prof, you keep yours. No, You're gonna no, use I don't it. Need okay. it. You don't need it. Oh, you're loud enough. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Okay. Do my number two. Uh, mine is a very simple job. Um, we've placed a number of people, about two or three, guiding microphones so that we can interact with the discussions that we're doing right now. These are the two professors. So how many of you actually have questions that you need to ask? Let me see, Matoho. Okay, good. So I'm just going to contextualize a few things. So basically, I'm here to shine on their shine and not do much. Um, just to reflect, uh, Professor Marwala talked about the political mood at the time, 1976, and why it led to things being the way they were, that um, black consciousness was the political mood of the time. There was a context of something he mentioned about the TVPC state, the fictitious state of Venda that he came from. And if some of you remember the time, you'll know that as a black person, even though you are in the urban area, you were assigned a state that you stayed in. I was born in bred in Joburg, but my birth certificate said I was from Guadalajara in 1973 when I was born. So there was a quote here, Professor Marola and saying, um, each generation out of obscurity must discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. That, I think, is targeted to the young people here. It's a challenge that maybe you want to reflect on the professor right now. But a couple of other things. I won't want to go into the four industrial revolutions. I think Lee could was about them, so I don't need to go into that. But um, the one a very important element about what this, the, 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 the lecture by the prof was that with any industrial revolution, especially the current one, the fourth industrial revolution, we should be subjects and not objects. Right, Prof? So I think it resonates with some of us on how. So think about your context and use it to make some reflection with the Prof on that. But Mema Mukheti Pakin, also, there were a couple of points that she mentioned that are quite crucial, and especially in this current context. Yeah, we want to decolonize education and use our languages as preferred mediums of instruction. She talked about the language. Well, good day to you, uh, Keshne. Uh, an interesting uh, memorial lecture here where the two professors, you know, just encourage uh, young people in South Africa, South Africans, to reflect. I mean, we had uh, who, uh, UJ Professor uh, Marwala saying that the fourth industrial revolution needs young people and for young people to honor the likes of uh, uh, machine, they must ensure that they take part. And amongst others, the most interesting one, uh, Professor Parkin, talking about language here, yeah, talking about dichotomies in terms of how we look at uh, uh, language and uh, multilingualism and you know saying that it's about time that uh, teachers ask relevant questions. He made a scenario there saying that uh, during his uh, data collection while he was doing research he found out that uh, most of the teacher would ask uh, themselves or other learners or even him so which language do I use and he said that was sort of an irrelevant question whereby he encouraged is that we use even African language, specifically South African language, to educate, you know, encourage that young people are able to learn in two languages. Uh, they just need a platform where they can be taught uh, with their language, saying that it's very important that South Africa honor people as, such as Tietzi uh, Machinini, if we remember in 1976, amongst the things that they stood against was to be taught in Africa, saying that it is about time that, you know, uh, as Africans, we take our languages seriously.
Well, that was live crossing indeed to the fourth TFC Machinini lecture underway at the Isaac Morrison High School in Soweto this hour. We are on the cusp of Youth Day 2019, a day marked across the country to remember the tremendous sacrifice of those who were involved in the Soweto uprising of 1976. Uh, the lecture we're listening to this afternoon is in honor of TFC Machinini, a student leader during the 1976 uprising, during which children took to the streets to demonstrate against the use of Afrikaans as a medium of instruction. Uh, today we remember a young fearless freedom fighter and student, a Mashinini, whose name will be forever etched in memory as one of the most outstanding leaders of the South African Revolution who left an indelible mark in the shaping of a free South Africa. Uh, of course, in the last hour we heard there uh, from Professor Mamukheti Pacheng, uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town, uh, a powerful address indeed by the Prof who emphasized that language is more than just a communication and thinking tool, but is indeed influenced by a host of social and political factors. She touched on the importance of mathematics education and multilingualism in the education space and says multilingualism does not impede maths education. Uh, the professor is indeed calling for a multilingual approach to mathematics learning and teaching where all our written texts used in the schools in the country are in home language languages and English and in a classroom environment language is deliberately proactively and strategically used well on that note it's time to take a short break I'll be back with more news at the top of the both of you the first question your institutions with regards to English being the tool of access to higher education now how far are you moving the ground in both your institutions to turn around the tide so that we keep our languages capital also in that regard, right? Professors, over to you. Professor Marala, you first. Yes. No, no, thank you very much. Can you hear Professor? Maybe I should just talk a little bit about what is going to be as far as language is concerned. We are going to, we are actually reaching what is called a post-language era. Devices in your ears. I will speak in Chivenda, and when it comes to this, it will be in your own You need to take it up a bit. Take it a bit higher. Okay. Am I clear now? Am it's clear? better. So the danger of that is that people are going to see no need to then. Uh, Prof, you, got, you may need to come to the front. Uh, can, can you hear me now? So in this post era, uh, language era, where we are going to have devices in our ears where you can speak your own language. When it comes to my ears, it is uh, in my own language. Uh, the danger of that is that people are no longer going to learn languages. And what we have not, we do not appreciate enough, is that the knowledge of knowing multiple languages is actually good for thinking. The people who can speak multiple languages tend to be better thinkers than people who speak one language. So that's one thing that we will need to, to worry about. Now, what are we doing in our, certainly at my institutions, at the University of Johannesburg, to attempt to bring more language inclusion? I mean, just to give you an example, uh, me and Professor uh, Fernando, we are writing an artificial intelligence book for children. And this book is going to be in Isizulu. Uh, it is going to be in Sisutu Salivua. And it is going uh, to be in Kosa. So what we are doing, 
What we are doing uh, as the University of Johannesburg is that we, we, are, we want our staff and students to learn, we want our staff and students to learn our University of Johannesburg official languages, because we have official languages, where all communications must be transmitted in those four official languages. The our first official language is uh, Isisu. Um, our second official language is uh, Sisutu Salibua, uh, which is uh, uh, Sipedi. But uh, we call it uh, Sisutu Salibua. And then we have uh, English and then we have Afrikaans. In terms of teaching in those languages, we are still mainly an English. What is going on? Okay. And you see, you know the reason why this is happening is because my mother had um, an argument with a neighbor, and we suspect my the neighbor has bewitched me. You know. <laughs> It's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. So uh, we 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 are still mainly an English uh, uh, teaching institution. Uh, something that we will re really need to think about. How do we make knowledge accessible to our staff and students in a language that is much more appropriate? Um, where things become even much more important is at the primary level. The primary level, that is where our young students, the pupils, are losing the opportunities to learn better because they don't understand the language. We take it for granted. I know by the age of your career, you have the you know, tendency to lecture. <laughs> so now, because you have a lot of questions that you still need to respond to, okay. could we just keep it short on this one? I think the young man gets the chance. You must make something for him to My is the one you're I gave you mine. Okay. All right, so if this mic is not working, I might as well put it down. We're doing a lot at UCT. I talked about the, what we're doing at the medical school for the doctors. Um, but what we're doing, we also have a, a multilingualism program at UCT that is located in our Center for Higher Education and Development. What that does, it runs different programs. One is to educate all of our staff members um, uh, to teach them is it close? We are in Cape Town. We believe that it's important at least to learn the language of the place. So there's a Masitete is closer program where people can register and take lessons to learn is it closer. Workers, academics, whoever can go in there, students, anyone can take that course. We also have support programs for modules. Like in the Faculty of Commerce, if you go online, you'll get support courses, support programs for in, in African languages. So you'll find that they teach accounting in an African language. The thing is online, students can just click and they can get the lessons, the accounting lessons or finance or economics, whatever, in easy courses. So there's a selection of modules that they can get that. It doesn't happen necessarily in class, but it's recorded and it happens mainly in the, in the College of Accounting. We also have in the mathematics department, and all of these are done through our Center for Higher Education and Development, where, and, and as I said, you know, you can do a ceremonial thing. You know, sometimes things are done ceremonially. So you're gonna translate things into many languages that are there, nobody cares, because what's the point? We are saying, this is a resource. You come here, you come from Limpopo, you speak Isperi, you are in Cape Town. We want you to be able to have that Isperi being supported in Isipedi. We don't do it across the university because it's, it's not yet possible because of funding, but we do it in accounting, in mathematics, that you can get courses in particular modules 
offered, lectures offered in your home language. The other thing that we have that's not well known, I mean, so we teach languages, we teach in languages. We expect people who are going to practice in public to be able to speak the language of the place. But the third thing that we're doing is that I know in our faculty of engineering and build and the built environment, as well as in our faculty of law, students are required, as a requirement, they're supposed to take a language that's not their home language as a course that they must pass. In that case, we don't force them to take easy course. We say to them, choose a language that you don't speak at home. Um, that's not your home language to teach. In that group of languages, of course, there are is it closer? We have a department that's functioning fully. That is it closer, and um, uh, but they can also take. We we have uh, uh, Mandarin. We we also have French um, and, and so on. Finally, you would have seen in the media groundbreaking, groundbreaking news that we are the only university in this country. Sorry, Prof. Marala, that uh, has started teaching. Uh, uh, the language of the Khoisan. Yes. Groundbreaking. We started this year. We offered, we offered it as a short course. Uh, we're offering it as a short course. The demand, we, we advertised and the demand is huge. Because the Khoi people is a language that's been lost. So, okay, can I finish? So the demand is high. We are funding it ourselves. It's expensive, but we feel that we have got to go. We are not charging the Koi people in particular. We don't want to tax them because we believe that it's important for them to, re, to recover the language. But we started teaching Koi. Our view is that this language has to grow, and we, as the University of Cape Town, are better positioned to teach that language. We want not just to, to stop with teaching Koi, but we want Khoi studies, but we're starting with the language. So we mean business when we say we are an African university. We don't talk much about what we do, but we do it without talking about it. Okay. Um, the next question for you, Prof. the responsibility of human beings now that the machines are going to be doing the majority of jobs, right? So what will human beings be responsible? What will their role be in the industrial revolution? No, no thank you very much. I, I, I'm reminded of um, a Japanese expression that says that um, it is completely inhumane to expect that which can be done by a machine to be done by a human being. I think to switch it off. No, it is just on right now. Okay, is it? Yeah. Uh, in this era of the fourth industrial revolution, human beings will do things that are human, like taking care of our elderly, like taking care of the sick, all those things, are, we will have to, to find a way in which we can be able to monetize them into uh, technology. Now the question is, in this era, how will people take care of themselves? Because they are going to be out um, some of the suggestions that have been put into place is the idea of a universal basic income for everyone. Uh, what is even much more uh, interesting is that the person who actually has proposed that is a big capitalist, uh, Elon Musk. Now, if, um, you know, if uh, we will need a universal basic income, where are we going to get the resources? Where are the taxes going to come from? Uh, Bill Gates says that we should actually start.
text robots. So the robots that are doing the work will have to be brought into the text domain so that we can be able to generate enough resources uh, to support the people, but you are supposed to be that machines. With me. Oh, okay. You are this one. All right. Okay. Um, I'm gonna put this down, and I'm gonna shout. We need to take people from this row. There's a gentleman there. So I get behind next two years, that one. Can we get, yes, that, that, can we get the question there? Thank you. Can I ask the question? Okay, thanks. Um, my name is Teboko. I teacher of math. I am professor of the Prof. Mamokheti, um, more research in your high, who work language. The way language is a impida, it's a tibela or a reciprocal So, for example, in I said this, I said this, mathematics, but get a bear, I said this, So, so, in the example, Professor Ugua Hore, Motlasi, Hari Ruta, Hoi Khan, Ruta Ka English, Mar. Or how change the gear? Ki in say it's a halang mo engine. Say it's a mo di gear di di change. Kolo ibe powerful. Seo is tamsa kaswan. So because of the dynamic here, what we feel between two languages, the English language is used to explain how to drive, but the African languages are used to explain the mechanism of the car. So as a result, learners do not appreciate the mechanism of what makes a car to work. So to address that, Professor Utaka Ishia multilingualism. Now, Kibataho puts up puts up in the context of the matriculants. Currently we are sitting with a situation where 30% of our learners are failing, first time. So we have 200,000 learners that end the system without success. Those 200,000 learners go into a program, give it one second chance. Prof, both of you, does that not present us with an opportunity to explore how to implement the results from research, like that policia, memma mukhetia, multilingualism, so that banaba maitang. Thank you. Right, I think we get the gist of the question. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take the second question. There's a gentleman with the cap. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Sanbonani, likama lami mushafi. I would ask Professor Marwala, but my vendor is not so strong. Just yet. Maybe it's time. Um, Prof, when I was young, a couple of years ago, we had some fights when I was still a student 
around what we call for free quality, but more importantly, decolonized education at our universities, right? And one aspect of it was in knowledge production. So my question is, do you think that multilingualism and pluralism of knowledge production can be used to create the capital that you said is lacking from our African languages? Thank you. Wow. Thank you. So the second question, the gentleman right now, what he was asking was, in the context of what you were explaining earlier, does that proposal that we use multi-languages as a tool to advance interest in mathematics, will that create the kind of social good that we were reflecting on earlier? Uh, Shafi, it will. It, it will, definitely. First of all, it, it is also a decolonial way of looking at this, because our colonizers actually sold us monolingualism. And, and, and we want to be like them, and so we want to teach only in English. And when we think we're opposing them, we want to do another kind of monolingualism. Again, their version, but in Setswana or in an, another African language. So I'm saying going the multilingual route, in my view, is decolonial because it recognizes that this space is not just occupied by one, just one group of people who speak one language. It's, it, it's occupied by many different people. It will help us with the social capital, the, the issue of uh, which languages have capital. I mean, what gives, what gives English the hegemony? By the way, Africans had, had the hegemony during apartheid. And what gave it power was the fact that it was demanded in many places, whether it's the army, whether it gave you, it made you, it gave you a particular status when you go in. It, it made, it created value, there was value in it. So you could get into a space even when you couldn't speak English. If you could speak Afrikaans, you got a way through, you were not stopped. At the moment, if you know Kosa, but you don't know English or Africans, you can't go through. And, and if, you, if we make, we, 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 we forget, it will contribute to adding capital because suddenly there will be a math teacher out there one day who we may say, thank you, but no thank you, we can't have you because you can't speak Sesotho in this school. We need people who can speak Sesotho and Isizulu. Shafi is better than you, so we can't have you. And the betterness comes only at the level of multi. That says there's value in your language, right? But, but remember that this thing can't just be done by citizens. This thing has to be done, the politicians have to buy into this thing first. Because we, we can create value on our own. In Parliament, our politicians can choose if they want to speak in an African language, by the way. There are interpreters. And after 94, there were a few rebels who did that, like decolonial politicians who did that. We've lost them. These days, everyone speaks English. You have to show that you are educated to speak English. But actually, they can choose. They can choose. There are interpreters in offices, in the rooms, and, and they can choose to make their contribution in a, in a language or in a mixture of languages, actually. And, 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 and that will add value. But they can also make requirements for, for working in particular government offices that you have to have a, a, a particular language. It will add to the social capital in the languages. So it's a multiple, you, you've got to have a multiple approach. We can't say you only do it with t mathematics teaching and learning, it will solve everything. That will contribute or it will benefit from something that government has put in place. Thank you. Um, we are in a slight panic, it's getting dark outside now, and uh, we still have an, an item or two after this that we need to reflect on. There are some refreshments outside as you get out of those exit doors, you know. Um, can I take two questions from this side? Yes, that. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, my question to Professor, my name is Molly Lamine. My question to Professor Marwala is, how do we skip the other revolutions, the first, second, third, 
if we did not go through those, how do we get to the fourth one without having finished the other ones? And also linked to that, how, how do we do, uh, skip to that if we have these high levels of illiteracy? We, we, we are going to reflect on the first one. And As you can see, professors can tend to go on and on and on, and we need to cut them. And there's the other question there. How did we skip the other revolutions? We are here, but we never participated in the others. So basically, how can we be able to be actively involved in this one without having participated in the other ones? Yebo. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for the presentations. My name is Klaus Bamunyela. I would like to ask Prof. Marala in relation to the argument about object of the, uh, the first and second and the third industrial revolution versus the subjects of the fourth industrial revolution. I want to understand from your intellectual assessment of the importance and qualification there of, of the fourth industrial revolution. Can industrial revolution allow us to, in, to inherit and take ownership and control of the production or the goods that were produced through uh, the could you Could you simplify your question, please? Just make it simple and not so long-winded. <laughs> Just get to the crux. Can fourth industrial revolution from your assessments allow us to take ownership and control of the production of the first, second, and third uh, uh, industrial that so that Project expense. Thank you. Okay, I think we got the gist of that question, Prof. It's about how we take control of the first, second, and third. Like the two questions are interlinked. How we take control of so that we resource ourselves for the fourth one. Yeah. Oh, okay. So how do we? participate in the fourth industrial revolution if we did not uh, certainly participate in the first, second, and the third industrial revolution. It is really through education. We know what it takes to succeed in the fourth industrial revolution. Critical thinking skills, ability to understand society, humans, and people at the same time, we have that. We know what it takes. All we need to do is to build educational infrastructure that is actually going to educate our young people so that they have the skills to be able to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution. It's really through education. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, mine is a very difficult task right now because I can sense that there is quite a huge interest and I'm going to request uh, the professors to, on social media to give us uh, details of their platform so that maybe additional engagements can happen and all right now as we leave we'll network some more with the professors maybe you'll get to have a, a question intimately responded to because we are privy of the time we need to move on and complete the rest of the program so unfortunately i'm going to close on the questions and i'm going to request i'm going to hand over to my colleague once more Thanks, Thank you, and thank you for your patience. Right now, I'd like to call um, Mr. Peter Lamola to come and do a presentation to our honorable family, the Machinini family.
Ntate Maishe Maponya, kindly come to the stage as well. He's still here, isn't it? Ntate Maishe Maponya. He went out. It's a bit heavy. Yeah. But let's put it this way so that it is. The family is just presenting the gifts to our speakers. Is a wood mic share still out? Yeah. My shema ponya. Yes. They said he just stepped out. I'll receive it on his behalf. <laughs> yes. On his behalf? I'll receive it on his behalf. Oh, you will. Behalf. Thank you. That's Fontate shema ponya. left okay. apparently that the Maisha has left we will do um, definitely present the gift to him before the vote of thanks may I just thank everyone for your patience we know we started a little bit late and our panel took slightly longer because of the interest. So we thank you for your patience. Also, if I can just thank, you know, with, with an event of this magnitude, we cannot do it all by ourselves. We had sponsors um, from the community, alumni, friends, and people who just pledged, young people who pledged. So we really would like to thank them. I'm going to name a few, but most of you, we've thanked you um, even before, uh, before the event. So we would like to acknowledge Putanang Trust, ZENF Trading Enterprise. And also to add on, we've got a, a, an organization of young people who pledged some funds to make sure that all our uh, uh, alumni task team members travel safely, especially the female ones. Um, when we were traveling back and forth between the media houses during the course of the week, up until today. Um, the young people that I would like to acknowledge are from an organization, Rural Economy from Pretoria, in collaboration with Dependable Strength. I would like to acknowledge <laughs> Mr. Mali. You know, these people and organization, they really put our safety first. We, we, they actually pledged funds to make sure that we are Ubered around um, the city when we were doing interviews. We, are, we thank you very much. We are very grateful for that. And thank you to Chawe Infrastructure Technologies, um, also a member of our alumni, uh, Mr. Koza. Thank you and Lee wholesalers, and many, many, many more. Um, I know we cannot, the list is very long, you know. People who contributed their time, efforts, and everything, support, not only in, in terms of um, monies, but we acknowledge each and everyone. 
uh, all the alumni members from all the, the classes, the years, uh, everyone from Maurice Isaacson uh, team, the school, the SGBs, all of you. If I've forgotten to mention you, don't think that we have forgotten, you know, the list is long. We appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you. <laughs> Lastly, on behalf of the school, may I call upon Ma'am Loretta Serrero to come and give a vote of thanks. Thank you. Um, the social platform star Professor Marwala. Twitter is at T Marwala. That's for Twitter. And Facebook, you just say Chilizi Marwala. But the prof, if you have a pen to write, you can engage with him on WhatsApp, on his cell number. You know, so you just go with the hashtag fourth Tessi Machinini memo lecture, you know, just memo. His numbers are 083-379-1357. So that's how you can be able to engage with uh, Professor Marana. And Mema Pake, what platforms are you available on? Oh, okay, they know, okay. At Feb, at Feb Academic. So you just use that, and isn't she Feb? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are almost done with our program. So, um, me, wakwa like it. Officially, si muso. Um, before Kuala e. Yeah. Um, before vote of thanks. Oh. Sorry, Loretta. Okay. Oh. Ntate Maisha is here. It's fine. Yes, everybody it's just a photo. It's fine, Peter. It's the same thing. Yes, it's a tattoo. Title, just hand this, over. This. Just, just for the photo opportunity. It's no, it's only one. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, Pap. Thank you. Thank you. Go, then I'll acknowledge the professors after. Yes, no, that's fine. You know, uh, I'm no longer going to cover what all the No, that's fine. Okay, okay. There you are. <laughs> uh, on behalf of Maurice Isaacson High School or Secondary School, um, we have one of the educators, the academic staff, to give a vote of thanks and close for us. Thank you very much. Learn as though you will never be able to master it. Hold it as though you will be in fear of losing it. Honorable and respected guest speakers, Professor Mamukheti Pake and Prof. Chilizi Marwala, thank you very much. Um, most valued members of the Morris Isaacson alumni, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. I, on behalf of the Morris Isaacson High alumni, the staff, the SGP, the learners of this institution and the entire supporting structures. 
even special guests in the audience, here together, would like to extend a hearty vote of thanks to everyone for gracing this important event and sharing this day with us. It's been a very long day. I would have loved to touch on what our two guest speakers have spoken about. But in short, Professor Chilitsi, I think you have invoked something in us by saying your presence and hoping that your presence at UJ will actually spearhead as you are nearer to us here. You are in Soweto. You will become the drivers of this fourth rev uh, uh, industrial revolution. And we believe that it will definitely happen in Soweto. We will become the subjects and not the objects, as we have indicated. Do we want to be relegated into the dustbins if we have inquired? I do not think so. This fourth revolution that we have spoken about has taken over, therefore, um, our artificial uh, intelligence indicates that we should be innovators. We need to start to encourage, um, to be the innovators rather than the, the consumers of everything. So the modern CAT machine activist, we have been left with a, cha a, a challenge that we have to be in, in innovators be producers, not consumers. Indeed, these are the wise words from you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Mamkheti, wow. This is a mathematician specialist. We always say dynamite comes in small packages. <laughs> I think she has left us with a huge task of being able to discuss, to start talking about the language of choice as stated by the policies. So, what are we saying about this language of choice? Can we say it is a false choice, as we have indicated? Or that not all languages are equally powerful? Therefore, what do we do as a school at Morris Isaacson? May I informally uh, inform you that here at Morris Isaacson, we are multilingual. We are teaching English and four African languages. And we always preach that they are all equally important so that they can be able to make sure that they excel in their mother tongue, they excel in English. A, a big thank you to both of you. I have a little anecdote about you. I think in uh, 2016 or 2017, there was an article in the newspaper about you when I started reading about you. Uh, that was, I think, in the city press. And as an examiner uh, of the district for English papers, I came across that article about yourself 
And I chose it to give as a comprehension to the great 11s. Thank you so much. Furthermore, we are grateful in our presence to be honored uh, with the presence of the Mashinini family and the Matabate family. Thank you so much for availing yourselves. May I ask the, all the educators, the current and the previous educators of Morris Isaacson, please may you stand wherever you are. May you all stand. Mr. Mashile, please. <laughs> all the educators. Thank you so much. I am also one of them. I'm very proud that I have been a learner here at Morris Isaacson, and I also became, I am an educator. I have been here for 36 years, so it's been a milestone on my own. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to our sponsors, as they have been mentioned, all of them, by Motlatze. For the perfect logistical support, financial, and guidance, I would especially like to thank the people who have been the backbone and drivers of this occasion, the Morris Isaacson alumni. May you please stand. Let's see who you are. Thank you so much. Thank you. This day wouldn't have happened without yourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for being with us and being part of this occasion this afternoon. It's been a real great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. We are now um, at the end of our program. There are refreshments, but before we go, can we just sing for the last time to say goodbye? Magu Benjalo. <laughs>